In this video I'm going to talk about leaded petrol, which is an example of a really bad mistake that science made that killed a lot of people and injured a lot more. I'm taking the story from the book Unleaded, How Changing Our Gasoline Changed Everything by Carrie Nielsen. Now, lead was first introduced in petrol in the 1920s. It was to stop premature ignition, um, so that when you compress the petrol it can ignite too soon, which gives a horrible vibration and reduces the power of the engines. Now, why would anybody think that putting lead in petrol was a good idea? I mean, it makes engines far more powerful and faster, so it's good for cars, but lead had been known for hundreds of years to be extremely toxic. In 1924, for example, just at the same time they decided to start putting lead in petrol, the, uh, one of the plants that made the lead they were going to put in the petrol, there were a series of grisly deaths from lead poisoning. Five workers died and 35 others experienced uh, uh, convulsions and hallucinations to do with extreme lead poisoning. So if it's so toxic, why put it in? Well, there were actually people back then, they said only lead can make this work, but that wasn't true even back then. They knew that other chemicals like ethanol could stop the knocking, as indeed we have unleaded petrol now. Um, the trouble was that only lead was a, a bit cheaper, but also it was something they could patent and therefore make money out of, whereas ethanol had already been widely used and therefore couldn't be patented. Famous quote, it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his salary depends upon his not understanding it. So if people stood to earn money from selling lead additives, it's very hard to persuade them that lead is a bad idea. And for a long time, they had a fairly good seeming scientific case that actually lead in petrol was not doing any harm. This came out from the research of Dr. Robert Kehoe, who for decades and decades was regarded as one of the world's expert, or the world expert on lead poisoning. Back then there were nothing like as many scientists as now, so there could well only be one lab in the world that's looking in on this. Now he agreed that at high levels, more than 80 micrograms per decimeter in the blood, lead was toxic. That was the level these people had all died and had hallucinations and convulsions that the lead plant had. And in fact, a lot of his early work was developing masking and various things to stop the lead workers getting polluted. And he did a good job there and saved a lot of lives. But then he was tasked with analysing whether lead was a problem more generally, especially the lead coming out of cars. Now, he was based at the University of Cincinnati, but was funded and partially based by the company that made the lead additives. So there's definitely an interest in showing it was safe. I'm sure he didn't regard himself as biasing things. But what he showed was that... So the question is, we know that high levels of lead are toxic. What about the low levels? It's actually rather similar to the old argument about the... Um, linear model for nuclear energy. We know that high levels of nuclear radiation kill you. What about low levels? Maybe the body can survive them. And that was his same argument for lead. That at low levels, he reckoned the body could actually metabolize it and get it out in the urine. So low levels of lead would not build up in the body. Now, we showed that people who'd been force-fed lead actually did have lead in their urine, which showed that it could actually be flushed out of the body. And then he went to some remote parts of the world and found that even in the most remote parts of the world, people's blood had substantial amounts of lead in it. So his argument was twofold. We believe that lead is everywhere, that humans have always had lead. It's been a natural part of human evolution for the last billions of years. Therefore, the body has had to devise some way to handle the lead. And in fact, we do. We flush it out with our urine. So given there's a natural background level of lead everywhere in the world, even the most remote places far from cars, there's no particular point in trying to uh, remove the lead from petrol because it's probably not that much worse than the natural level of lead. And we know that this lead is everywhere in the world and people can handle it. Sound good? Well, it sounded good for a long time because for decade after decade after decade, lead was put in the petrol. Um, there's only one problem. It was all crap. And the person who found this out was Dr. Claire Patterson, who wasn't a research on the health effects of lead and wasn't funded by the uh, lead industry. He was actually a geochemist, and he was trying to use lead isotopes to work out the age of the Earth. Basically, when the Earth formed, there was some uranium in it, and some of this uranium decayed in different decayed in different isotopes of lead with long half-lives. So by measuring the build-up of these different types of lead, you can measure the age of the Earth. 
The trouble was that whenever they tried to do this, they'd take samples of rock and, and try and extract the lead and measure the isotope ratios, they found huge contamination. They were getting lead all over their hands, all over their equipment. It was blowing through the airs in their labs. It was really, really hard to actually just isolate the sample from the rock they were trying to measure. And so Claire Patterson became a bit of a fanatic about cleaning his lab. He actually spent seven years of his life. That probably wouldn't be happened now. If you'd done seven years with no result, you'd be out. But back then, it was actually possible to work on something for seven years without getting sacked for lack of productivity. And he slowly and carefully and methodically cleaned this and cleaned that, worked out new procedures for keeping the contamination to a minimum. A lot of his procedures are now standard in labs. So people have learned from this. But after seven years of this painstaking work, he was finally able to get really clean, uncontaminated measurements of lead isotopes and was able to discover the age of the Earth, 4.6 billion years, which was amazing. He was so excited he nearly had a heart attack, he felt at the time. So having done that and made a name for himself, he then turned his attention to all this contamination. Where was all this contaminating lead came coming from? What he found out is that Dr. Kehoe's results, remember Dr. Kehoe said there was lead in urine and lead in samples from anywhere in the world. And what Dr. Patterson found was that in fact, the lead that Dr. Kehoe had measured was contamination. There was lead in Dr. Kehoe's lab because his lab was in the city and there were cars driving past belching out leaded petrol. But if you actually took really clean samples from remote areas, there was no lead in their bloods except one place that Dr. Kehoe had analysed was actually a Mexican, remote Mexican village where they actually ate all their food off lead glazed plates. plates. <laughs> That's another story. But when you did the survey properly, using Dr. Patterson's painstaking methodical decontamination, the whole idea that there was a background level of lead went out the window. There is no background level of lead until people started putting lead in paint and cars. There was very no lead. Likewise, the urine samples, people who were not exposed to lead, did not contain lead and their blood did not. So the whole idea that lead was natural and everywhere and the body could wash it out, that was all due to contamination. Dr. Kehoe had just not been careful enough. He had not spent the seven years of methodical work to work out how to eliminate all the contamination. And using Dr. Patterson's results, more researchers were able to, for example, extract lead from teeth and they would discover that how really bad even low levels of lead were. It didn't cause the rapid death, but still had all sorts of bad effects. It caused more violent behaviour because it blocks uh, neurotransmitters and the development of young brains. Particularly if you grow up in a polluted area with a lot of lead in the petrol, it does really horrible things to your brain development. Really, really horrible things. And there's probably no safe level of lead. As low as you can possibly get it is not low enough. But of course, we then had this outsider, this geochemist, saying that, uh, disagreeing with the world authority, Dr. Kehoe, for decades has been the expert. The fact that Dr. Kehoe was actually funded by the lead industry was ignored. Also, for tax made Dr. Patterson, he was an outsider, he didn't know what was going on. Um, various other studies showing the bad health effects, they were attacked on the same grounds you've been talking about. Maybe you did you your statistics right. People would go through them with a fine tooth comb looking for any possibly slightly dubious statistic. People funded by the industry. And so for a long time they managed to keep a delay and a delay. It was going to be too expensive for getting to redo everything. But eventually people figured out that they had to get rid of the lead in petrol and they've done so and people's health has improved. Lessons learned from this. Top experts, world authorities of prestigious universities can be arrogant and wrong and they can use accusations of scientific misconduct as weapons. We've seen there is a lot of scientific misconduct, but people could also use it even when it isn't the case. Um, there's an argument that if you're publishing something that people might hate you for, you have to be cleaner than clean, more careful than careful. You have to make sure there's nothing at all that can be used against you. And self-interest, being funded by petrol industry, ethanol industry and so on, is a powerful source of unconscious bias.